Good afternoon. Coming from Central Bible Church, we are meeting a little bit earlier. Actually, we're only meeting online because we're not having an evening service tonight. But we have begun a study in the book of Isaiah. And the introduction to Isaiah and the first two chapters we did, and they're audio on our website. But we don't know how long we're going to be temporarily delayed from meeting on Sunday night. So we will continue our study in the book of Isaiah beginning at chapter 3 and going through chapter 4. And tonight I have 14 uh, points to the message, and you'll see those there from chapters 3 and 4 in about 30, 35 minutes. So we won't spend a lot of time on each one. We'll be looking at the resources removed, the rulers, the ruin, the righteous, the reward, the roaming, the rising, the rebuke, the rebellion, role reversal, reproach, redeemer, remnant, rinsing, and refuge. Let's pray. Father, bless the study of your word. Speak to our hearts through it. Meet the needs of those who are watching and listening uh, today. We thank you that your word is powerful, that it's relevant, and that it speaks to our hearts. And we ask that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin by looking at Isaiah chapter 3, we're going to first of all uh, look at the resources that are removed. Hope you have your Bible with you and turn to Isaiah 3 and 4. I'll have some portions of scripture on the screen for you to be able to see, and we'll read some, but it always is helpful if you are looking at your Bible and maybe choose to do some marking in your Bible. But Isaiah 3, 1 says, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the staff and the staff, the whole state of bread and the whole state of water. They had been hoarding up things, and this is prophetic and speaks for near future as well as the tribulation period, a uh, little more distant future. Uh, but people can uh, hoard up food and they can store food and they can have all the things and think that they are prepared, but the Lord can easily take it away. And that's what this verse says in verse 1, that the Lord will take it away. So our must, we must put our trust in the Lord not in our ability to prepare for crises that may come uh, into our lives. James kind of helps us with that when he says in 4.14, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So we don't know how long we will be here. We don't know we don't, if we'll be here tomorrow. We don't have that promise. And so our preparation is our trust in the Lord because he says he would remove their resources. Then he goes on and he addresses the rulers there. It says the people shall be oppressed in verses 2 through 5. And in these verses he lists three different kinds of rulers. There are those who are the legitimate authority, uh, those that judge, the prophet, the ancient, the honorable man. Those are terms that are used in our KJV. And those are legitimate authorities that God uh, has over the people to help them. And then there's some in training. Uh, it's referred to as the captain of 50. And those are like junior officers in training. And that one is mentioned in verse 2. And then he also mentions some unlawful counselors uh, where it talks about how they are cunning and they are eloquent in their speech uh, here. And these are, are ones that were popular with the people, but they were forbidden by God. Uh, because they were practicing enchantments and diviners, as they were called there. And so he says there's going to be a total collapse of authority. The children are running the house, and everything revolves around the children. Uh, it doesn't revolve around the marriage of husband and wife. And we see even some of that today, but God says that's coming there as part of the judgment on Judah. Then number three, we see the ruin that is coming. He says Jerusalem is ruined here and a lot of that was because of absence of leadership and they would go to people who looked nice uh, and thought because of their outward appearance they would make a good ruler and so they said rule over us and they would answer in verse 8 don't make me a ruler uh, there and they were desperate for leadership uh, there and those who they had asked to be rulers were refusing to take responsibility and it's time for uh, the pastors and the leaders of, of America who are believers to take the leadership and be uh, the leaders and take the responsibility uh, to speak uh, the truth and love. And then there's an adversary of God. 
It says their doings are against uh, the Lord in verse 8. It says Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. What a wonderful phrase, the eyes of his glory. And the eyes of the Lord search to and fro through all the earth. And he wants to be glorified through his people there. And we need to be the godly leaders that he wants us uh, to be because there are many who are adversaries of God. And we need to speak up uh, for the Lord and take a stand uh, for him. And then ruin is coming because they announce their sin. In verse 9, he says, The show of their countenance does witness against them. They declare their sin as Sodom. And we know about Sodom and Gomorrah and how they were destroyed. And the term Sodomite comes from that city, of course. It says, They hide it not, verse 9. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves there. And so the ruin is coming. It says, They hide it not. They come out of the closet, as it were, and they make it publicly known, and they celebrate it. They declare their sin, as Sodom did. And God says that there's coming judgment on Judah because of being proud of the sin that they're living. And he says in verse 9, Woe unto their souls there. And they bring it on themselves, verse 9 says, They have rewarded evil unto themselves and so whenever man sins the judgment he gets is because of his own sin it's not because of god god has given the warning and god has given the solution and when we turn to god we have forgiveness and cleansing from all of our sins and rather than walking around in our sins and pride well he has a word for the righteous as well in verse 10 he says say to the righteous god has a message for those of you who are believers just as he did for his nation Israel. Not all of Israel were true believers, but the message, first of all, he says, it shall be well. There's going to be judgment to others, but God says, it shall be well to those who are righteous. In verse 10, say to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Just as the wicked eat the fruit of their doings and they reap their own consequences based on what they sow them, and God says the righteous will eat the fruit of their doings as well. And so whenever we do that which is good and right, God says there are rewards. There are wonderful, positive consequences whenever we are righteous in the Lord. And he is the one who makes and declares us righteous. Then he says there's going to be a reward. There's a reward of his hands in verse 11. He says, woe to the wicked. It shall be ill with him. And so it says it'll be ill with him. It says it's going to be well to the righteous, and God is going to look after them and protect them. But it's not going to be well to the wicked. It's going to be ill with him. There's going to be uh, trouble that comes his way. He says the reward of his hands, in verse 11, shall be given him. He's getting what he deserves. Man cannot blame God. If he dies and spends eternity in hell, God has done all that he could to save man from the consequence of sin and the judgment that is to come. Hebrews says it's appointed the man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. And so those of us who are believers, when we serve the Lord, he has declared us righteous through Christ. There's going to be a great reward, and he looks out after the righteous. But those who reject the solution, the salvation, the cure for sin, and Christ Jesus will have their own reward and they will have to pay for their own sins because they have rejected the payment of sins given through Christ on the cross of Calvary. Then we come to the roaming. People often roam. The Bible says we as sheep go astray from Isaiah 53. But in verse 12, it says, as for my people, and again, he's talking about his people here, not just all the world, but he says, woe to the wicked uh, there. And he says that as they roam, their children are going to be their oppressors there. And so rather than leading the children, the children begin to rule the nest, so to speak, uh, there. And not only that, it says the women will rule over them. And we'll talk a little bit about role reversal in a little bit when we get a little farther uh, down, but this is part of the judgment of God. And then the third thing he says in this verse 12, 
but they which lead thee will cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths there. And so when there is ungodly leadership and we follow ungodly leadership, it causes others to err and fall by the wayside. It's so important that we as believers, that we provide the leadership for our children, for our church members, for our nation. As believers, we need to be the salt and light uh, of the earth because people are roaming. They are straying away from God and God is calling out to them. He has sent his son uh, to earth to die for them and he wants them to come unto him and be saved and stop their roaming and trying to find their own way to God because we'll not find our own way to God. It is only through Christ. Well, then there's going to be a rising and this is the Lord himself rising, not rising from the dead, but as you look at verse 13, it says, The Lord stands up to plead, and he stands to judge the people. There. Aren't you glad that whenever we stand before God, that we don't stand in our own goodness? Because the Bible says, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. How to perform that which is good, I find not. And so all of our righteousnesses, Isaiah says, are as filthy rags. And so we have the Lord Jesus who stands up to plead for us. And he declares that we are righteous and that we're in Christ and we have trusted him. We're not saved by our own merit, but we're saved because of what he has done uh, for us. And he stands up uh, to plead and he asks this question, what mean ye that you beat my people to pieces? And God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is our defender. He is our protector and there's none to stand and plead for the people so christ himself their messiah he stands to plead for them and this being a prophetic book a lot of this is speaking of the tribulation period and we'll see some of that as we get into the rest of chapter three and four and because at that end time he will come and he will plead for his people we come to number eight of our 14 and here he begins to rebuke rebellion as it's found in the daughters of Zion. In verse 16, it says here, Moreover, the Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and they walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and make a tinkling with their feet. Here, as we read from verses 16 and on, here, and we look at the uh, rebellion of these daughters of Zion it says they're haughty and in this passage of scripture uh, he lists 21 characteristics of their dress and the way that they carry themselves the way they adorn themselves and, and this passage is not an indictment on women by any means but rather it's against uh, certain women and the way that they were carrying themselves very much unlike Proverbs 31, where it says, who can find a virtuous woman? And there we read about the godly woman. But here, there's going to be a rebuke and judgment on this particular type of, of woman who, who has the wanton eyes and walking and mincing as they go. This personal adornment there. And we're going to look at these 21 words. As you look through these verses of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 3, there's some words that are very not common English words, uh, and we won't spend a lot of time on these 21 things because if we do, it would take way too long, but you could get a book and study uh, Jewish uh, clothing and customs and find out more about these. So we're just gonna hit very quickly on them, uh, 21 of them. The first one is a tinkling ornament about their feet. This is a leg bracelet or an anklet worn by the rich and the vain. The next one in verse 18 is calls. This is a headband, a luxurious headband that was worn for beauty. And you say, well, what's wrong with these things? Well, there's nothing wrong with any of these things. It wasn't so much of what they were wearing, but 21 things that were showing the excessiveness of what they were doing and their pride and haughty spirit. And they were focusing on the outward appearance rather than on the inner woman of the heart there and that is what God uh, is condemning here the, the third one 
you look at that one, it says they were wearing round tires like the moon. What in the world are round tires they were wearing uh, here from our King James Version? And this is the decorative ornaments, and oftentimes the camels uh, had these on, and they would put them on, and so the more decorative the camels were, uh, the more impressive uh, they were. That was their mode of transportation uh, there. And, and so the women had these ornaments on as well, so they were doing it also for uh, to impress uh, other people uh, there. We should look nice, but our goal is not to impress uh, other people with the outward appearance. The fourth one is chains, and that's a pendant or an earring. It's translated collars in Judges chapter 8, and, and you've seen that as decorations as well, where people put a collar, uh, like a necklace, but it looks more like a collar uh, around their neck. Number five, bracelets in verse 19. These are ornamental bracelets, and it's an item of luxury here, not just a common uh, bracelet there. And then mufflers, uh, not like a muffler on a car. Uh, this Hebrew word has to do with a veil. It's a light cloth that's worn over a woman's face, and it conceals her face, it protects her face, it adds to the beauty that's there, and so they have all of these things. This is just number six, and there are 21 words uh, here that the Lord is rebuking because of their emphasis on fashion here. Seven was bonnets in verse 20. This is a turban. It's translated headdresses in Isaiah 3.20. It's a long cloth that's round, wound around the head. It's around and around and around uh, there. Then there were ornaments of the legs or ankle chains. Again, it's an item that was for luxury uh, there. Certainly most of these are not necessity. And then there's the one that's called headbands in verse 20, and those are sashes. And Jeremiah 2.32 uh, uses this Hebrew word to describe the attire of a bride. And so here they have all of this uh, very impressive uh, outerwear uh, and clothing uh, that they have. And then the tablets. Uh, this word tablet in the Hebrew comes from two words. It has to do with the inner person and the house. In which that inner person lives uh, there. And, and so the focus that these women had that he is rebuking and judging here, their focus was on the outer part, or what I put here, the soul case. I got that term from my grandfather. We call him granddaddy uh, on the Davis side uh, there. And oftentimes I would ask granddaddy, I'd go out to see him and I'd say, how you doing today? And he said, well, I'm feeling pretty good, but my soul case is kind of tired and, and weary. And that's what this body is. It's a soul case. It's a housing for the soul. And they weren't nourishing and putting emphasis on developing their soul, uh, their spirit, their personality, their walk with God. They were putting all the emphasis, 21 different things. They were putting emphasis on the external, trying to impress mankind, both men and women. Number 11 of the 21 earrings in verse 20. It's from a verb that means to charm here. And so it's not just for appearance, but it was done something to charm, just as the same word when they used to charm a snake uh, there, the earrings. And then the word rings in verse 21 is a signet ring with the seals on them. This particular word in talking about the tabernacle, where they carried the tabernacle from place to place as they wandered in the wilderness, it had rings where they would put the poles to carry the cart uh, there. So these were obviously not of small size and insignificant here, but they were very showy here as they were wearing uh, these rings. Number 13, nose jewels in verse uh, 21 uh, here. And these nose jewels uh, here is, uh, as the book of Proverbs talks about, these nose jewels when the book of Proverbs mentions that it compares this jewelry uh, in a pig's snout to a woman without discretion. And that's the word nose jewels in verse 21 there. It's often associated with idolatry as well. And then number 14, changeable suits of apparel. Having a closet full of not just clothes, but this particular Hebrew word has to do with festive robes. And so these people would have more what we would call formal dresses than the average person would have clothes altogether. 
And, and so the festive robes are obviously for a time of rejoicing and parties and those kinds of things. And they just had so many of these. And God was condemning the changeable suits of apparel. Move on to 15 and 16. He says they had their mantles. This is a cape. It was a part of the royal garments that the high officials wore. And then the word wimples there. I looked at that word and said, what in the world is a wimple there? Well, this was a cloak. Ruth certainly was a godly woman, and she wasn't anything like the woman described here. But she had one of these. Uh, it was a, what she had when she went to Boaz, and he had the six measures of barley grain that he loaded on her. And she had it in her cloak, and she was able to uh, put it over her back and carry it uh, with her there. And so that was another part of the clothing here. And then verse 22 says they also had crisping pens. And this was a purse or a bag. Uh, and we know that, uh, you know, most women, they have to have their purse, their bag, and, and some are big and some are small, but this particular one that is mentioned here and called crisping pens, it could carry up to a talent of silver, 75 pounds uh, here. And so whatever you want to put in that bag, you know, you can carry it, and oftentimes it's a long travels, they might need that, but it was for show, uh, whether it was decorative or larger than others, they did it for show. And then verse 23 says their glasses, not speaking of eyeglasses, but this is a word for the looking glass, uh, as it was once called there. It has to do with mirrors. And so here they're always looking in the mirror. And it's okay to check the mirrors. We should check the mirrors. We shouldn't just go out uh, with egg on our face, literally, or mustard or anything else here. But the emphasis here was on the outward appearance there. They always probably had that one of their crisping pens, you know, just always checking the mirror, making sure everything was right so that people would be pleased and they weren't nearly as interested in making sure that the mirror was focusing on the heart. And God's Word tells us that the book of James says it's, the Bible is like a mirror and it reveals to us the condition of the heart and gives us opportunity to straighten out things on the inside rather than the outside. Three more to go as he rebukes the rebellion here, the daughters of Zion that are haughty, and it says that they have fine linen, and these were garments of great value. In Proverbs 31, again it says, who can find a virtuous woman for a price is far above rubies? And here it says in verse 24 of that wonderful chapter that we often use at Mother's Day, uh, it says the virtuous woman makes fine linen sells it because she knows there's a great demand for the rich and the fashionable women and rather than making it and keeping it to impress others the virtuous woman sees opportunity to provide for her household so she makes those expensive things and she sells it uh, there to help provide for her family and then number 20 the hoods in verse 23 this was a headpiece worn by persons of authority in Zechariah 3 5 it talks about the high priest uh, wears this particular hood this headpiece and so they want to be a person of authority they want to be impressive they want to outdo everyone else and so 21 things they make sure that all the fashion of the day they had everything that could possibly be had uh, there and number 21 says veils Verse 23, which is a shawl worn by the well-dressed, those who are look, looking to be fashionable there. And so the pride and the self-centeredness is the problem. It wasn't the jewelry that was the problem. The overkill of all of this shows the pride uh, that they had. First Peter 3, 4, speaking to women, says, Let it be the hidden man or woman of the heart. And that which is not corruptible, all these things, 21 of them, they're corruptible things. It says even the ornament, and that's what these things were, ornaments, and that word is often used in this passage here, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So God is looking at the ornament of the heart, the meek and quiet spirit. He's not impressed with 21 different kinds of clothing and purses and veils and jewelry and on and on and on. God's not impressed with that, but he does look to the heart. And we should fashion our lives, not after the world, 
the way it fashions itself, but we should fashion our lives after the likeness of Christ. 1 Corinthians 7, 31 says, And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. And so there were five consequences in verse 24 of these daughters of Zion and what would happen to them. And listen as I read verse 24. And it shall come to pass, five things, that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. Instead of a girl, a rent or tear. Instead of well-set hair, bones. Instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. And so as we look at these five consequences here, uh, we see this baldness instead of uh, grays or her covering uh, was a gift from God. Uh, the girdle, a loincloth uh, there was like a, a sash and now it's split or torn. Rent was the word uh, there. They are wearing a sackcloth instead of a stomacher uh, and that is a word that means an expensive fine robe. So instead of wearing the expensive fine robe of rich and prominent, now it is a sackcloth, which is for the poor and beggar uh, there. And there's burning instead of beauty. And so just as the fire burns and scars uh, there, there's the scarring uh, that comes from burning and the disfigurement that comes from that. So God says, though all of these things are fine to the world and people look after those things there's coming a time where it's going to be burned it's going to be disfigured and no matter how beautiful we may make the outward appearance whenever we go to the grave it decays and it's all the same there's no eternal value in those things and so god wants us to put the emphasis on fashioning the inward man then there's a role reversal. Chapter 4 is a lot shorter than chapter 3. And so as we look at our 14 points here, it says here that seven women will take hold of one man, which is often the case after war. A uh, few men are eligible uh, there. And so here these women are doing like Eve. They're, they're going to reverse the role, and they want to take charge uh, there for God to put Adam uh, in charge of the garden there. And what they're going to do, they're going to rebel against God's plan, they're going to usurp the headship of man. And we see a lot of this is coming during the tribulation uh, period. The church will be called out by then. But they say, when these seven women grab a hold of the one man and say, marry all of us there, we want to be called by your name. And that shows that even though they're reversing this role, that ultimately God has placed the husband responsible so with the privilege of being the head of the household comes the responsibility that God holds the man accountable. He held Adam accountable for Eve's wrongdoing and Adam's wrongdoing as well. But Adam was responsible uh, there. And so man might try to reverse the role or women may try to reverse the role. But God says man will answer for that even when they're called by his name. And there was a reproach. They said, take away the reproach. And of course, the reproach in the Old Testament was the scorning and taunting because they could not have children. Uh, this barrenness in the Old Testament, you see that with several people, and they felt bad, and it was bad enough that they felt bad that they could not have children, but others made fun of them for not being able to have children. Number 11, the Redeemer, called the branch of the Lord. He is their deliverer. Verse 2 from chapter 4 says, And that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And this branch of the Lord is the Redeemer. He is their deliverer. During the darkest days in the history of man, uh, yet to come, during the tribulation period, the Bible calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, of course, meaning Israel. It's coming, and Jesus is the deliverer. And he will come there at the end of that tribulation period, and he is the branch of the Lord. All capital letters, we know that means Jehovah as the Lord Jesus comes. God always has a remnant. He always has those that remain. And verse 3, those that remain in Jerusalem 
it says they shall be called holy. They are going to be a special object of his favor. What a wonderful thing that God will call his people holy. Now, there's nothing holy about us, but we have the holiness of Christ, the righteousness of Christ that he imputes to us when we get saved. In John chapter 17, what is referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer, as he's praying there to God the Father, uh, he uses the term in addressing God as Holy Father, John 17, 11. He refers to his Father as Holy Father. Think of those two words as Jesus prayed them together. God is holy. He is so holy that we can't even imagine. Uh, there's nothing holy about us, and there's nothing sinful about him. And so the holiness of God, because he's so holy, and we're so sinful, we are separated. But Jesus didn't say holy God, though he is a holy God. Jesus said holy Father. And so that first term of holy separates us from God. But Jesus called him Father. And that unites us to God as part of the family of God. And we have the holiness and the righteousness. Holiness means sanctification. Uh, God imputes to us the righteousness of Christ. And we shall be called holy. Just as his people Israel will be called holy there in Jerusalem when he comes again. Number 13, there's going to be some washing, some cleansing. It says, and when, they, when they shall have washed away and shall have been purged here. Uh, when we look at that word in verse 4, that says, when the Lord had washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. The filth of the daughters of Zion. We just saw those daughters of Zion with those 21 sins that they were doing there. The outward appearance, and every one of them was a, a, an assault against God. It was an offense against God. And it says he will wash away the filth of the daughters of Zion. And that's what he does for all of us. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Uh, and this word washed away has to do with bathing oneself or even cleansing clothes where we take out the stains and the dirt uh, there. But not only does he use the word washed away, there's also the word purged. And this word purged is used four times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word. And two of those are for washing the offerings for sacrificial ceremony there. And so when we think of what we are to do from Romans chapter 12, it says that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And the only way we can present our bodies as a living sacrifice and holy to God is that he has washed away our sins and he has purged us. Uh, he has uh, as you used to do dishes before the, the dishwasher came along. You know, you would have two people and say, you want to wash or you want to rinse uh, and dry. And so we'd wash them and we'd rinse them. And that's what he does. He washes all of our sins away the moment we get saved. And then as we walk along this path here on earth, we oftentimes slip and fall and sin. And then he does the rinsing uh, of us as well. He cleanses us from all sins, and we are to present ourselves holy and acceptable to him. And then the last verse of chapter 4 ends the message of these 14 points of the judgment of Judah, and it has to do with a refuge here. It says, and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a cover from storm." And from rain. And so God is our refuge. The Lord Jesus Christ is our refuge. It's there for shelter and for safety and for security. And there's a cover. There is a hiding place. And Jesus is our hiding place. In closing, let me read to you uh, words from the hymn Hiding in Thee. Oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I. My soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly. So sinful, so weary, thine, thine would I be. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding.
night and in deep. In the calm of the noontide, in sorrow's lone hour, in times when temptation cast o'er me its power, in the tempest of life on its wide heaving sea, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. And the last stanza says, how oft in the conflict, when pressed by the foe, I have fled to my refuge and breathed out my woe. How often when trials like sea billows roll, have I hidden in thee, O thou rock of my soul. And the chorus says, hiding in thee, hiding in thee, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for the judgment that was given to Judah. Uh, Lord, it stirs our hearts. Help us not to put the emphasis on the outward appearance, but that the inward person that you would continue to uh, clean us up uh, and that we might find rinsing and full washing through the blood of Christ for our sins and our shortcomings. And Lord, we want to honor you. And we thank you that Christ is our refuge and we can hide in him. And the storms of life and the troubles that come our way, uh, he is our deliverer. He is our refuge. He indeed is our hiding place. And we pray in his name. Amen.